Hello fellow cyborgs! Today I want to tell you that I recently binge read an autobiography by Anthony Trollope because I was able to find a free audiobook of it on LibriVox, the app which his volunteer produced audiobooks of works out of copyright. The narrator was Jessica Louise the entire work through and it was just such an easy listen to, especially because it is nonfiction but it's set up into chapters that are chronologically based through Trollope's life, and he distinctly goes into the works that he wrote and his opinions on them. This book does spoil quite a number of books, so I did the hard work for you. You should not read this autobiography by Anthony Trollope unless you don't care about spoilers to Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, three books from the Palliser series, which is Can You Forgive Her, Phineas Finn and Phineas Redux, two books in the Barsetshire Chronicles, which were The Small House at Allington and The Last Chronicle of Barset, and then four standalones he also kind of spoiled, which was Orley Farm, Miss Mackenzie, though this was vague, and since I haven't read it, I'm not sure how much of a big deal it is, The Claverings and Lady Anna. So I've done the dirty work for you, and I have pulled out the tidbits that I found most delightful and the bookish tidbits that I thought were the most revelatory for me and that I can share with you that aren't spoilers. So if you want to hear more about Anthony Trollope as told through my lips in, in summary and great summary, then um, grab a cup of tea and stick around. All of the notes are on my phone, so I'm going to be looking at it and you are going to cope because you're getting free summary information. So the first thing that I wanted to tell you about is that after joining the Garrett Club in 1861, and this is one of, this is, I don't know, this is one of the Victorian London men's clubs where they sit around and they drink and they talk about stuff and no ladies are there and that makes it better somehow. Anyway, so after joining the club in 1861, he got into the habit of playing whist before dinner, which is a card game, and he kept this habit for the rest of his life, which was over 20 years. And unless he was doing something very important or something he definitely couldn't postpone, he would spend the afternoon before dinner playing whist, and I thought that was adorable. He also shared with us his opinion on the best books in the English language. So the first book he thought was the best is Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, but then he read Ivanhoe by Sir Walter Scott, and that was the best book in the English language. And then he read The History of Henry Esmond by William Makepeace Thackeray, and that is his final say on what he thinks is the best book in the English language. I don't know if these are his favorite books or if he just thinks these are the best books. Trollope loves characterization far more than plot, and he's very critical of the works that he wrote when he thinks he failed at characterizing the way he wanted. So I think that these three books that he thinks are the best books in the English language, he mentioned things about characterization and how real these people felt. So I don't know if these are his favorites or if it's just what he thinks is the most important thing about literature being exceptionally good in these works. So there's a whole section in this autobiography where he gets very gossipy and juicy about opinions of contemporary writers, and some of them you probably know about, so I'm giving you information about three of them because some of them I did not recognize, but that section of his autobiography might be a good recommendations for Victorian authors that we no longer really consider, who aren't considered masters now, but potentially were by Trollope, at least in the Victorian era. Trollope predicted Jane Eyre's everlasting popularity, and he was very distressed by Charles Dickens' grammar and writing style. He thought that he didn't like it. <laughs> he also said of George Eliot and her writing style that her prose suffered from having too much philosophy in it. <laughs> so Anthony Trollope loved hunting, like hunting on horseback, and it was one of his favorite hobbies. And at one point, he, he worked for the post office for most of his life, and he was sent to Ireland to sort things out, the post office in Ireland. And one of the things that he would do is he would go on horseback in hunting attire, travel to these rural places, and then accost the 
landowner or the the person who lives in the house and say, how's your mail? How how often is it received? Do you have to pay to get your letters? And he and the people would sometimes answer him and sometimes not because he looked like some random guy out hunting with his horse asking them about mail. He retired from his work at the post office only after he had written 19 novels. So this was after he published The Last Chronicle of Barset. And it wasn't so much that he waited after 19 novels. He was waiting until he had earned enough money to cover the pension he would be forfeiting by leaving the post office early. So he was treating writing as a full-time job while also having a full-time job at the post office. And the way that he kind of managed this, his writing process and fitting it into his schedule was twofold. When he was working for the post office, he had to do a lot of traveling by train. And so he would spend all of his time traveling on train, writing his novels. And then later in his life, he references that he always woke up at 5.30 in the morning he wrote at that time. And he woke up only because an old groom that he employed would bring him a cup of coffee and, and force him to get up in essence. So he would start writing before his work at the post office or before he was doing other things after he had quit the post office. And he always treated his authorship like a job. He always set a moderate pace for himself and he always stuck to it. And if he didn't stick to it the next day, he would make up for it. But he kind of scorns the idea that authorship is a creative pursuit that is de determined by inspiration and the muse. He very much was like, nope, this is a job. You need to work at it. And I'm assuming that he got this partly from his mother, Frances, I think her name was. She started writing novels at the age of 50 to support her family after her husband and his career pursuits and also his health began to fail. And so she had to just crank out these books to keep her family from starving. So regarding his work at the post office, he took pride in his work. And among other things, he was instrumental in stopping the trend of rural letter carriers charging people for the delivery of their letters and also for ensuring that regular delivery happened in such areas. I guess because these were rural areas that no one was really checking up on, occasionally letter carriers would tell these people that they needed to pay them money because they had delivered the letters when that wasn't true, but they didn't know any better. So he stopped that. And I think he also created mailboxes. I, or like post, like the big post office boxes that you could drop letters in. He did a lot of cool stuff. He was very proud of his work for the post office. So switching gears to his work. So after his third novel, which is called La Vendée, he wrote a play, the plot of which he later used again in the first book of the Palliser series, Can You Forgive Her? He struggled with the characterization of the main character, his female jilt so to speak. And he later tried to correct it in Can You Forgive Her? But he didn't believe he was wholly successful in that. So moving on to another beloved series of his, The Chronicles of Barsetshire. So his brother, Tom, gave him the plot idea for the third book in that series, Dr. Thorne, because he couldn't think of an idea and he needed to write another novel. He wasn't actually that impressed with Dr. Thorne or with his next novel, I think it was his next novel, The Bertrams, because he thought the characterization really lacked in those. And as I mentioned before, he valued characterization 20 times more than plot in his books. So looking at the fourth book in The Chronicles of Barsetshire, Framley Parsonage was his first and only one of two books that he published serially and he started publishing before he had finished writing it. And this gave him a lot of anxiety because he had seen this happen multiple times where authors published pieces before they were finished and then they remained unfinished forever. And he really didn't want that to be the case. It made him really upset. The other work that this happened to, where it was published before it had been finished, was The Land Leaguers, which was the book he was writing at the time of his death. 
So I don't know how unfinished the Land Leaguers is, or if someone finished it. I haven't looked into that. I haven't researched that yet. So switching back to the Palliser series, before he wrote the second book in the series and the following books, the second book being Phineas Finn, he tried for a seat in Parliament at Beverly, but he had an awful time campaigning in the countryside. I think I remember him saying like he was just covered in mud and he also didn't win. It seemed like he was kind of trying to compete with an old incumbent favorite and it probably wasn't going to go in his way. And he had even been warned by someone in politics that he was not going to win, but he tried anyway, because it had always been a long-standing dream of his to serve his country in this way. So he was disappointed, but not heartbroken. So through his autobiography, when he's referring to his work, a lot of the time, he'll finish telling you about a story and say, oh, it, it wasn't very good. Like, it, it's not going to make a lasting impression, but it didn't offend anybody. He just didn't seem to be particularly proud of most of his novels. He didn't seem to see himself as a novelist with a capital N. He even admitted at times to needing quantity over quality for his works, which I find very interesting. The book that he wrote that he thought was the best book that he wrote and was actually proud of was The Last Chronicle of Barset, which is the final book in the Chronicles of Barsetshire. And if you've read that book, which I have not, though I now know what happens. So in that book, there is a significant and tragic plot point. And that plot point was decided upon when he overheard two people discussing his novels and complaining about his overuse of some characters. And so he marched over to them in his frustration and promised to kill this character that night. So if you've read that book, I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. And I find it very funny that this is the best book that he feels like he's ever written. And one of the major plot points, I'm assuming it's a major plot point, was made in like spur of the moment anger over some random critics of his books. So, so those are all of the fun facts I have for you about Anthony Trollope. I definitely am delighted to have learned more about him. His autobiography, especially with the audiobook in my ears, really was very readable. And especially because it was organized in that I could look forward to hearing about a next book, it almost felt like I was listening to a very long podcast about Anthony Trollope's ideas on his work. So he seemed like a pretty decent person and his autobiography was as delightful to read as his works have been. So if you are a Trollope fan and you don't care for spoilers or you have already read all of the books that I listed at the beginning of this video, I highly recommend that you check out his autobiography to learn a little bit more about this interesting gent. So thank, thank, thank you very much for watching and until next time, try reading Samantha Lee Trollope and continue to be lovely.